Well, let me first of all uh, begin by thanking uh, the organizers for having this uh, nice idea of preparing this workshop, uh, which I think has been a success with so many people uh, registered. So, and of course, let me also thank uh, Jean Maria for the for the invitation to to speak here. So, what I what I propose to to talk about is uh, to give uh, some sort of survey about uh, the results that we have obtained uh, on uh, on the problem of boundedness of Berman projections in tube domains over cones. Uh, when I say we, I mean um, well a, a large group of people. Um, various subsets, subsets of these authors have collaborated in, in joint papers, uh, giving uh, many results about, about this problem, which was more or less started 25 years ago by Becolet and Bonami um, in, 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 in a paper in the case of light cones. So uh, the problem is still open for general cones, but in the case of light cones, uh, it has been settled by, by using some of the techniques that we developed in these papers and uh, by the proof of the decoupling inequality, which uh, was an open problem for some, for some years until Burgen and the Matter solved it in, in 2015. So what I would like to, to do in this talk is to somehow survey the, the results that we did, uh, the connection with the, the decoupling conjecture and state some of the questions that still remain open about, about this problem. Okay, so uh, our domains of interest are, are the, the two domains over symmetric cones. This is the, the usual definition, Rn plus I uh, omega, omega is a symmetric cone. Um, in the case of one dimension, uh, they are they correspond to the upper half plane. The only cone in one dimension is the half line. So these are generalizations of the upper half plane. So here I have to apologize. I couldn't come yesterday. Probably Alex Nagel spoke a lot about this, this kind of uh, two domains. Um, uh, so there are some, some reasons and motivations to, to consider these domains. So one is a very classical one. Uh, two domains together with their uh, generalization, the, the, the Siegel domains, essentially give uh, uh, all the possible unbounded realizations of, uh, of the classical family of bounded symmetric domains in CN, uh, as, as, well, as they were classified by, by Elie Cartan in the, in the 30s. So it is a, it is a, very, a very classical domain, but uh, and it's natural to consider the problems of, of boundaries of our projection in, this, in these families. So a second interesting uh, property of these domains is that they have a, a global geometric structure, uh, not, not just local. I mean, you know a lot of information because you can identify the domain with a subgroup of the group of conformal transformations of D. So from these uh, properties of the group, you can, for instance, obtain explicit expressions from the Berman kernels. And those explicit expressions lead actually to, to, to concrete bounds for the, for the operator, et cetera. And a third motivation, which is probably the, the, well, one of the most interesting for us, is the fact that the, the, the Berman projections in these domains are related with a number of interesting operators from harmonic analysis. And, and this is not surprising because uh, you think of the one dimensional case uh, and you consider the Cochip projection. Uh, well, the Cochip projection in the upper half plane is essentially the same as the Hilbert transform, which is a a key operator in harmonic analysis in one dimension. So you want to extend this uh, to, to, to higher dimensions. The, the Cauchy projection gives an operator which uh, in Rn is, is no longer bounded when P is different than two because the multiplier it has is the characteristic function of the code. So if the Cauchy projection doesn't work in higher dimensions, you can look at Berman projections. And in this case, the multiplier is smoother and it looks more like a bochner risk multiplier in, in, in harmonic analysis. So this operator, the bochner risk multiplier operators are a very interesting family uh, from the point of view of harmonic analysis. So they, they, to understand this connection one was one of the, of the objects of this, of this research. Um, so here I will be mostly talking about symmetric cones, but actually th these classical domains can also be defined for, for an extension of this notion, the homogeneous cones, and probably uh, David Becolet in the next talk or, or Marco Peloso uh, tomorrow, they will speak a little bit about the single domains in homogeneous cones and some results that can be extended in, in that direction. But for this talk, I will concentrate only in two domains on, on symmetric cones. 
So, so what is a what is a symmetric cone? Um, well, for me, it is just a, a cone. For me, it's an open convex uh, set which consists of half lines. And uh, when you say that the cone is homogeneous, what you require is that any any two points in the cone can be connected by by uh, uh, can be mapped into each other by a linear transformation that preserves the cone. So, so the cone somehow can be identified with a subgroup of the linear transformations in Rn, which preserve the cone. So this, this group identification is one of the keys of the, of the things that we are doing. And then when I say that the cone is symmetric, not just homogeneous, I put one extra assumption here. The cone has to be subdual, which means that uh, for the natural inner product in Rn, uh, the dual of, of omega coincides with, with omega. So this, this symmetry gives uh, well, better properties and, and uh, maybe a better notation for the things I want to stay. But many things are actually true also for homogeneous cones. So the, the, the most basic example would be uh, the usual light cone in, in, in Rn. Um, I, think I, had a, I think I had here, yeah, I had a drawing here. Uh, well, so, so this is just uh, the, usual, the usual cone. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, this kind of picture actually is, is not the correct one to, to understand all the properties of, of the cones. So you look at the light cone, for instance, in R3, in terms of matrices, then um, the properties of uh, the, the group structure and the properties of the matrices uh, will actually give you the, the necessary information to, to deal with this problem. So to convert this into, into, into a symmetric uh, matrix, you just write the points in R3 in this form. So this is a symmetric matrix. And then you know that uh, if, uh, if, uh, if, your, if your vector here belongs to, to the light cone, then the determinant of this matrix coincides exactly with the Lorentz form. So it would be positive. And if, if it belongs here in the light cone and you are in the forward part of the light cone, Y1 is positive, Y1 is essentially the same as the trace. So the cone can be identified with a set of positive definite symmetric matrices, two by two matrices over the reals, right? So this, this idea is, is, is important because actually, uh, basically all the cones um, that you can consider all the symmetric cones can be classified as cones or symmetric or Hermitian positive definite R by R matrices over uh, different fields. Okay, typically the real, but you can also put complex uh, quaternions, and there is one special case of, on, on the octonions. So, mm, well, I, I, I don't want you to, so you, you, don't, you don't have to know about the, this general fear of symmetric cones, but uh, in, for this talk, you can concentrate, say, when I say, uh, when I talk about the cones of rank two, you can think about the light cone. So they are like two by two matrices in a sense. And when I talk about cones of rank three or higher than three, you can think about symmetric cones. And then these objects here are just the, the, the principal minors of the, of, of the determinants, which, uh, well, let's start. Uh, delta one would be the, the, in the first corner. Delta two is the two by two matrix. And then the principal minor from there. And then delta R is the full determinant of the, of the, of the matrix, right? So the positive, the definite matrices are characterized by the principal determinants being positive. And this is a one possible description of, uh, of these cones. So what are, what are the three key properties that I need from omega? Well, the, the first property is that it identifies with a, with a group, which is actually explicit. And if you have one of these matrices, one way to do this identification is by, by uh, uh, splitting the matrix, uh, the symmetric matrix as a product of a lower triangular and an upper triangular matrix. Okay, so this group is uh, the lower triangular matrix which uh, you can also split as, a, as an impotent and an abelian part. An impotent part will be the lower triangular with ones in the diagonal. The abelian part will be the, the, the diagonal matrices with positive entries. Then, um, so this gives actually, this identification gives the right coordinates to work in the cone and to exploit the homogeneity that, that you want to exploit in order to have nice formulas. Uh, the, the, the second important object that we need is that uh, are the characters of this group. So actually they are, they are explicit, they coincide with the characters of A, and uh, since A are diagonal matrices, they are basically the entries of the diagonal matrices raised to different powers. 
okay? So this notation corresponds to, to, to exactly that, okay? So delta j over delta j minus one, which are the principal minus, will give you the j entry in the diagonal the matrix A when you make the decomposition, raised to the power nu j, and then you multiply over the possible entries. And this is the definition of a, a generalized power or a generalized determinant that we are going to use uh, in, this, in this work. So these things are, are explicit. And then the third tool that, that we need are the, the gamma integrals in the cone. So it turns out that you integrate over omega the exponential function and you put here one of these uh, um, generalized powers, then uh, there is an explicit formula here because of the group action. This converges if and only if uh, gamma is, uh, sorry, nu is bigger than, than a fixed number that maybe later I will say wh what it is. And then you recover here a constant, which is the gamma function in the, in the cone. And again, you, re you recover the uh, generalized power to the, uh, to the minus nu, exactly like you would do in one dimension. Okay, in one dimension, this is the invariant measure in the cone. In one dimension, this would be just uh, the power C, and this is the usual formula for, for the gamma function. It can be generalized because of this uh, homogeneity properties of the group in, into this setting and even in, in homogeneous cones. Okay, so once I have set uh, these, uh, these notations about cones and tubes, uh, I define the, the Berman space. So they are just, this is the set of holomorphic functions which belong to LP in the tube domain. Um, I define the Berman space with a weight and the weight that I consider is just, um, uh, so there's something I don't see because <laughs> there's a zoom part which is written. Okay, I'm moving now. So the weights that I am going to consider are of course uh, powers, the generalized powers that I defined before, right? So when nu is equal to n over r, which is the, 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 the power of the invariant measure, so you don't have any weight, you have the usual space. But in general, you can consider uh, this more general family of weighted spaces, which actually also plays, plays also a role in this, in this theory. So when p is equal to two, they are uh, Hilbert spaces and the Berman projection is the usual orthogonal projection from L2 into A2. And it's given by, by, a, by a kernel, a reproducing kernel, and here, uh, well, uh, there is a, uh, an explicit formula for this kernel, which one can prove by identifying A2 with an L2 space using a paley winner type theorem. So all this theory that holds in one dimension can be adapted into, into this setting of two domains over cones. The paley winner theorem is correct, and this allows you to express the Berman kernel as a Fourier integral of uh, some sort of multiplier. So this is the multiplier that I said before that is more or less related with, um, with, with the Bogner risk multipliers. When nu is large, this is smooth. When nu is small, it's, it's not so smooth. Um, so this is, a, this is a gamma integral. So this uh, can be computed explicitly with the formula I put below. So there will be a constant here. And then when you change the variables, you, you are gonna get a power uh, of the determinant, one of these generalized power of the determinant evaluated in C minus W bar. So th this, is, this is explicit, this is an important thing. You can compute when this belongs to LP and then uh, you can try to, to well, use this information in, to study the main problem. So the problem that we want is the boundedness of the, of the Berman projection uh, from LP into LP. For P different than two, for P2 this is clear. And, uh, and well, what happens here actually is that um, the Berman kernel uh, doesn't belong to all the LP spaces. There is a, a, an index P nu tilde, which is uh, um, bigger, which is finite and bigger than two, so that this, these Berman kernels do not belong to the LP prime spaces. So this is not well defined and the operator is not bounded. So this question will never have the, the answer P between one and infinity, except when you are in one dimension. In one dimension, then this number is infinity and there is no problem. But when you are in higher dimensions and when you are in cones of rank two, three or, or more, then the, the, the range for boundedness here will always be strict, okay? Strict, strictly between one and infinity for some number that one needs to compute. So actually, so I put here that I will consider this question not just for, for LP, but also for mixed norms. This is very natural and you will see soon in the proof why. So the mixed norm spaces for me are LP norms in the X variable 
and then LQ norms in the Y variable with this measure that I'm considered, with, which is, uh, is the, the, the generalized power minus N over R, which is the um, invariant part. Can I ask right. a question? Yes, sure. Uh, did you comment about the relation between G0 and N over R? Uh, I mean... Yes. Um, so if, if these weights are all the same, um, so let me see, wait. So here, if you put a eta a nu one, nu two, nu r all the same, you get here the usual determinant because they cancel, okay? So you have the usual determinant raised to a power. In that case, uh, that they are all the same, the G zero is N over r minus one. N okay. over r minus one in one dimension, it is just uh, um, zero, okay? So G zero would be N over r minus one if all the weights are the same, okay? But in general, it is not. So there is something here, n over r minus one, and then there is a vector here, which is like zero, one, and then uh, r minus one over two, I think it's one half, and r minus one. So the, it is a vector actually, okay? okay. It, is, it is a vector, but uh, uh, I'm going to move quickly to, to weights, which are uh, diagonal, they are all the same. And when they are all the same, if you impose the, the condition that nu is bigger than this for each entry actually is the biggest one that dominates and the biggest one at the end is, is n over r minus one. Okay, M maybe this formula I wrote here is not completely correct, but, but uh, okay, it will appear later in a, in a, in a, in a slide. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I was more or less here, yes. Uh, Actually, this condition also ensures that these spaces are uh, not null. If, if nu was smaller than these spaces would be null because of the paley winner theorem, essentially, you, you, you can show that there, there are no functions there. It has to do with local integrability at the end of, of the objects that appear. Okay, so what is, what is the first approach one would try to use to prove boundedness of, of the Berman projection? So you would use the approach that works in one dimension, which is somehow uh, forget about the, the possible oscillation of the kernels and put the absolute value inside and call it that operator P plus. And then you want to compute the LP norm in the X variable of, 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 of the Berman projection, put the, use the Minkowski integral inequality and pass the norms inside. And here you pay with this absolute value, okay? Then now you have here an integral over du and this integral over du, this doesn't depend on you. This is explicit. Uh, because you can use the, the, the explicit formula and the homogeneity of the of the of the group, and then you are going to be uh, you are going to be obtaining um, a positive operator. Okay, so this operator, this g function in blue, is this function here. So now you have to take an LQ norm in the y variable, and then somehow uh, if the so if the operator s nu is bounded from LQ into LQ. So this operator P plus is going to be bounded. So you are reducing the problem of complex variable to a real integral and a real operator. And this thing can also be reversed. So if, uh, if, if S is bounded, P plus is bounded. And if P plus is bounded, you can also show that S is bounded. So the two problems are actually equivalent. The boundedness of the positive operator on the boundedness of this real operator S nu. This, this operator, sometimes we call it a Hilbert integral because in one dimension, this is exactly what it corresponds. And then, uh, well, since it is positive, the strategy you would use to, to show boundedness is the, the Schur test. Um, well, when you use the Schur test, you obtain a range, but the range that you obtain is much smaller than the range suggested by the local integrability, by the integrability of the kernel that I put in the previous slide. So in the previous slide, there was a coefficient here, p nu, p tilde nu, or q tilde nu, it doesn't matter. And then if, if q is larger than this, then it cannot be bounded, the operator, because the kernel doesn't belong to that LP space. Um, so you would conjecture that maybe the, the, the projection is bounded here, but if you use this strategy with the operator s, you would only get boundedness in a strict, smaller domain here. Okay, and there is a, a big gap that you don't have any answer if you avoid this uh, oscillation of the kernel. So just to put some numbers, so this is the strategy that was used by, by, by Becole and Bonami in, the, in their first paper in 95. They did it for the, for the light cones and, uh, with no weights. And in that case, in, you are in dimension three, 
the numbers that you would obtain is L4, so between L4 and L4 thirds, the, the projection in R3 is, is, is bounded, and for P larger than seven is unbounded, and the gap is of this, of this size. So let me so so this this strategy can be extended to this to this more general setting of more general cones and and, and weights. Uh, maybe the the observation that I make is that uh, if you use the sure test here, you are going to obtain. So it is not difficult to 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 use the sure test and obtain a range, and that range is going to be optimal when you have diagonal weights, or if you, when you are in rank two. But for some reason, if you use the 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 sure test with the usual test functions, which are these generalized powers, the range that you obtain of boundedness for this operator, which is a positive operator, should be easy to, to characterize exactly when it's bounded. While if you, if you consider non-diagonal weights, then and rank larger than three, then we don't know what is the exact range of boundedness for this operator. Now, so there is a limitation here. And this limitation, I think, is related with another limitation that I will show later for the for the Berman projection. Okay. Okay. So this is already one question that uh, we we investigated recently with with Cyril Nana in a in a short paper in friendly content in Che. But uh, well, for the moment we don't have an answer to that. Okay. So let me give a second approach. So uh, the first approach was uh, just to put the absolute value inside. The second approach is more geometric. This was started by Bonami, Collet, Peloso, and Ricci for light cones, and then uh, was generalized to, to more general cones and was extended to, to another situation in, in later papers. And this approach involves um, the, one of the key tools is the mixed norm spaces, okay? which maybe in the first approach are not so important. Here in this approach, they are important because the strategy here is to take P equal to two. So the first norm that you take is the LP norm in the X variable. If this is two, you can use Plancherel and you can pass to the, to the Fourier domain and there the multiplier is positive. And you can try to use this strategy of positive operators to obtain a sharp range of boundedness. Okay, and well, it is not so simple as just uh, using the sure lemma. You need to know something more, some geometric information. And this is the spectral decomposition of the cone which I will discuss in the next slide. And combining these two things, one can prove that P nu is bounded in L2Q if and only if, and then there is here a range. It's two times the number that one obtains from the, uh, from the naive, from the trivial approach, okay? So for P equal to two, you have this line, which is sharp, and uh, from the, from the, from the uh, trivial approach, from the approach of positive operators, you get one over Q nu, which is this rectangle, the approach of positive operators doesn't depend on P, it's valid for all P because it only depends on the boundedness of the S integral in, in for Qs. So you interpolate this rectangle with this line and you get this green hexagon. And this is the green hexagon that, uh, that appears in many, in many of the papers that we have written because it's the only information we knew at the moment about boundedness of this operator. Okay, so sharp result here. A sharp result for the positive operator, they merge together into this picture. And now you test with counterexamples. And when you test with counterexamples, these papers contain new counterexamples compared to, 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 the, to the one I told you before about the, the integrability of the kernel. The example of the integrability of the kernel essentially is this line. But using the spectral decomposition, you can produce an example for this line, a counterexample, which involves Rademacher functions. Um, and small, uh, small bumps concentrated in, in points of the spectral decomposition. And then one can also produce another example here using Hardy type formulas. So, so there are counterexamples for this region. And then there is this little triangle here where nothing was known at the moment. Okay, so these two strategies lead to this hexagon and this here was not clear what could happen. Okay, so, um, let me elaborate a little bit more on this, and, and later I will tell you what happens here. Well, these ideas that I have written here uh, are for, for symmetric cones, but they can be extended to homogeneous cone, and, and that, that, has, that has been done by Becolé and Nana, first for the Bimber cone, I think, and then Nana and Trojan have a very nice paper where they make a very general extension to that setting. So this hexagon is, is the same picture as essentially for, for, for all, all, all of the cases of cones and weights. 
Okay, let me tell you what is this spectral decomposition. Um, so G omega is the set of linear transformations that preserves the cone. And then uh, what you would do here is uh, in the cone, you identify the cone with a, a subgroup of G omega, the subgroup H, and then you introduce here uh, a measure which is invariant under H or even invariant under G, okay, a distance. And then using this, so you identify the cone with a Riemannian, uh, Riemannian space, and then you, you introduce the, the Riemannian distance, which is invariant under G. Then uh, using this distance, you construct a separated, a one separated set in the cone, and then you construct a partition of unity associated to this separated set, okay? So there will be some balls which cover the cone, have the finite intersection property, and then these functions, have Fourier transforms supported in these balls, and then the sum of these functions is the identity of the cone. Then uh, a key feature of this, uh, of this um, um, spectral decomposition is that uh, these important functions that we use and that appear in the multiplier expressions and so on, which are the, the principal minors or the generalized powers, they essentially are, they are essentially constants within each of these balls so because of the group action, okay? C can be written uh, as a, uh, an action of, of, uh, of, uh, of an element in the group with the center, and then you can essentially remove that element and get the center here. The same happens with, uh, with the inner products with a fixed uh, point Y in the, in the cone, and this is uniform. You can replace Y dot uh, C, by y dot the center, and this is essentially the same quantity, modulo uh, universal constants. Okay, so these expressions appear later in the multipliers, and then I'm going to use a little bit Paley decomposition to, to try to understand uh, this problem, to attack from a harmonic analysis point of view, and I need to know that these expressions are more or less constant when I, when I use this decomposition. So here is a sketch of the proof uh, now uh, of what one would do, how one would use this spectral decomposition to prove boundedness. Okay, so this is the, the expression of the, Berman, of the Berman kernel. There is a convolution here, and there is one extra integral in the, in the imaginary components. And then uh, in the real components, you can look at this convolution. Uh, you can write it down as the inverse Fourier transform of the product of the Fourier transform of the kernel. Remember that the kernel had an explicit uh, multiplier, which is this thing. Uh, times the exponentials, and then this function, the Fourier transform, this function f uh, is here, okay? This notation means the Fourier transform only in the, in the C variable. Then there is an extra integral in V, which I write in blue, and I put it inside the Fourier transform, and this all this object in blue, I'm going to call it g hat. Okay, so now uh, you only think about x, and you fix y, um, what you have here is a multiplier operator, which uh, looks more or less, as I said, as a bogner risk multiplier, okay? It is supported in the cone near the boundary, the multiplier is zero, and it has a, and this con well, it has an abrupt, a non-smooth non change, but uh, the larger nu, uh, the smoother the multiplier becomes near, near the boundary. So how are you going to attack this operator? Well, um, the way to, to do this uh, is, well, we do this in three steps, but basically what we are going to do in the first step is to introduce here the little bit Paley decomposition that I described before, okay? So here, everything here is supported in the cone. So I can put here the partition of unity, and then I have to take the LP norm of, the, of this Fourier transform of this partition of unity, okay? So the first step is to prove this inequality. I don't know if this is, written in more detail here. Okay, so I will have, I will have a, a sum of, of uh, so this is the partition of unity acting on, on, on my function G, which is more or less this object. And then I want to use an inequality to uh, exploit as much as possible the orthogonality uh, of this uh, partition of unity. Okay, so this is the key inequality. The, the, the better power you can put, the better power S that you can put here, uh, well, will give you better results at the end of the, of the day. So how are you going to use this one? In, so when, when P is equal to two, you, what you can use here is just, uh, uh, well, uh, Plancher L, and then you can put S equal to two. When P is equal to two, the best power that you can put is S equal to two. And you would like to have S equal to two always, but this is not going to be true. The inequality is not going to be true in that setting. 
So when p is general, uh, say p equal infinity or p equal one, you can use the triangle inequality and put s equal to one. And if you interpolate between the triangle inequality and the p2 inequality, what you can get is the power s equal to the minimum of p and p prime. Okay, so this is like a, a trivial power that you can always use when you want to use, so when you want to explode um, orthogonality, say, without using more information about, about the functions here, just that they are almost orthogonal, all right? So you use this and you put it here, what, what you are going to have is, this is part of the Fourier multiplier, now you localize it with the test functions and then they are essentially constant and they come out, okay? This, this, this inequality used in this expression gives you this. So now I tell you how to continue from here. So now we have a positive expression. We have already used part of the, of the oscillation of the kernel encoded in this, in, this, uh, in this inequality. And now to continue from this expression, now you have to integrate in the variable y. So you take uh, uh, this, uh, the right-hand side the raised to the power q with the, with the measure. And now you want to integrate. And now you're going to have here all this object raised to the power q over s. Now, uh, you would like to put the q over s inside the sum, and if you are able to do that, uh, well, you will, we will get an expression here from which it is not too hard to, to conclude, to finish, because you can more or less dualize the argument and, and finish here with the LP norm of f. So one of the problems here, the second step, the, the problem which appeared in the second step is how to put the qs power inside here. Okay, so that can be done using um, a sure test lemma. Okay, so, so basically, um, let me see. Okay, yes. When, yeah, okay, I was saying that when, we, when you put the power here, there is a, a gamma integral, this gamma integral is transformed this, and then in order to justify this, when Q is smaller than S, this is immediate that you can put it, but when Q is larger than S, which is at the end is the interesting case, then because everything is positive, you can put here a sure test argument, which is multiply and divide by one of these test functions and then use holder inequality, pass things to one side, and then you, you are going to get essentially that, okay? That will create a restriction on the indices that the use of the sure test will introduce some gamma integrals and gamma integrals are not always convergent. So you are going to have an, a restriction on the indices and this restriction of the indices is precisely what gives you the figure of the green hexagon that they put below. Okay, this number uh, Q nu S, I don't write explicitly what it is, but uh, it corresponds exactly to this line. Okay, so you use S equal to one, you would be in the, in using the triangle inequality, you would be in the rectangle that I said before. You are in S equal to two, you would be using Planchard, you would be exactly here, and you are in the middle, you are using that. Okay, so this is exactly what, what, what happens. And then uh, once you are, you are in this part, as I said before, it is not extremely hard, it's, it's not too hard. Well, one has to work still a little bit, but it is not hard to pass from here to F using somehow a dual argument that doesn't introduce any new restriction on, on the indices. Actually, this, this step is related with something that maybe Marco Peloso will mention in his talk, which is the fact that the Berman functions have boundary values which belong to some sort of BS of the space. Okay, so this is a sort of BS of norm, and then uh, the, the Berman projection is always bounded into this BS of norm, which is basically this last part of the inequality. All right, so the key observation here is the following. So suppose that uh, we were able to prove this inequality, this key inequality that exploits the little Paley property with S equal to two for some P's which are not necessarily two then if we can get S equal to two here, then automatically we would be in the conjecture range because then the number, the restriction that appears in the Sur lemma, the, this number big Q nu two is exactly, it, it matches exactly what appeared in the, in the previous figure, okay? So we would be exactly in this line with S equal to two. Okay, well, you, you cannot expect S equal to two always because here is not going to be true, but you can expect that S equal to two maybe holds when P is between two and this index, okay? And that was one of the, of the connections that, uh, well, with the, with the decoupling inequalities that I will, I will draw. Okay, the figure was here as well. So, so this is the question. Can we prove this thing for P 
piece between two and this number. So even in, in general cones, this is a question that you can ask in general cones. So in light cones, it is possible to do it, but you need to know more information about the geometry of the balls, okay? Because we have only been using so far the orthogonality and nothing else. So let me now move to, to light cones. So in the case of the light cones, the balls are, are explicit. Uh, so these balls form a covering of the full cone and if you want to understand how they look like, uh, well, basically they do three things. First, uh, you have to take a dyadic decomposition of the cone, say in the vertical axis. Then you truncate one of these of these pieces of the cone, say by two to the j. And now you take a dyadic decomposition going to the boundary. So you take slices of the cone, which have a, a length, a width, say uh, two to the minus l, the distance to the boundary. And then once you have a, one of these slices of, of width delta, then here what you have to put is square root of delta. You have to do one farther dyadic decomposition of this annulus, and then you have to put the square root of delta if this thing here is delta, okay? So suppose now that the inequality that I want to prove, this one with s equal to two here, instead of proving in the whole cone, I try to prove it only for functions supported in this slice, which is simpler, it's just a smaller slice. So it turns out that if you can prove that here, you can actually, this is something we proved in the 2004 paper, you can actually pass from here to the full cone, okay? And prove the full inequality. It is not too difficult to sum over all slices and then sum over, over all the uh, uh, dyadic decompositions. You will lose some epsilon in the process, but that is okay because uh, you, you are opening, you are proving boundless in an open region. So, well, this is now uh, the isolated inequality that you can pose for this problem, okay? A real analysis uh, in, in inequality. Is it true, this inequality in this range of P? So in dimension three, this number is six. So for P between two and six, you want to put a number two here. Okay, so when we, when we were working on this problem in 2004, so we knew that this could be true, uh, in, well, the, something could be true here because, because they can put a square function p equal to four and there is, there is an improvement over the, the, the trivial inequality that, that, that I put in that case that is, was used at the moment in relation with, with, the, with the restriction multipliers in the code. So we knew already at, at that moment that one could go a little bit into this region. And in fact, Tom Wolf was working in a similar problem so we could even get into the, the sharp line for large p using some results of Wolf. But the full conjecture here was not clear if it was going to be true or not. Okay, so this is something that we work uh, for some time with, with Andreas Seger. We had some partial results and then the good news arised uh, in, in 2015 when Burger and Demeter motivated by, by completely different problems where this kind of inequalities also arise, were able to prove uh, uh, the, the full conjecture of the, the decoupling inequality in the full range of indices in all dimensions, okay? First they prove it for, for paraboloids, then also for cones. So this is also true in this setting. All right, so for all P between two and, and this number and six in dimension three, the inequality is true. So as a consequence, uh, you actually obtain a, a solution to the problem that I, that I just mentioned, okay? The, the projection is bounded here in the full conjecture region. Good. So let me say something now. Let me see how much time I have about the case when the, when the weights are not equal, okay? When the, sorry, when the, when the yeah, when the weight is, is non-diagonal, okay? These numbers can be different. So here's the precise expression of the G0 that, that, that Jean-Marie asked before. Um, this number D is the dimension of the, of the field. It would be N minus two in the case of the light cone and one, two, four, or eight in the case of the real uh, complex cotillion setter. So the question now is about this here when you put a, a more general weight, which is not necessarily diagonal, and then what happens? So this was considered by, by Daniela de Bertol when he was uh, studying his PhD thesis with, with Julio Ricci in Pisa. Then um, in this case, the weight now is a, a product of, of, uh, of the principal minors. And if you think of the light cone, which is the case of rank two, it's just a product of the Lorentz form, which is the determinant, and uh, the first, uh, the first uh, minor, which is y1 minus y2, to raised to this power. 
So what happens here? Well, the thing is that, uh, well, this, this region, this region in the case of light cones, uh, reads as, as follows, uh, nu one has to be positive and nu two has to be bigger than then n two minus one. So the difficult situation appears when this nu one becomes close to zero. So if nu one and nu two were both bigger than n, n half minus one, you will, have, you will have a very similar situation to, to the previous result. But here you try to use all possible weights. When nu one gets close to zero, this becomes negative. Um, well, this is less and less regular, and uh, there is a new phenomenon happen, happening here. Okay, so it was not clear in principle how to solve this using the, the coupling inequality. So this is something, oh, so here, here are the figures, so you, you, you understand what I say. This would be the situation when both weights are bigger than n, n half minus one, an hexagon like, like it happened before, uh, but if one of them becomes smaller, one of the things that happens is that you no longer have the naive approach. The naive approach gives you a rectangle here, which is based on this number. But when nu one is smaller, this number is smaller than one half, and there is no rectangle. There is no naive approach here, no, no boundedness at all of the positive operator, not even for p equal to two, the positive operator with the positive Berman kernel is, is not bounded anymore. So you cannot interpolate with that uh, to, 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 to start with. Then this figure becomes, uh, from an hexagon, it becomes a rhombus. And then the counterexamples leave here something which is more strange, OK? Something which is not just a triangle, but it has this, this strange shape. And that uh, when nu becomes very, very small and close to 0, uh, well, some of the counterexamples concerning integrability disappear, and you get this kind of figure here. So what De Bertol could show in his thesis is the boundedness in this rhombus that appears, that appears here. And then it was not clear. It was not clear what to do, how to use the decoupling inequality in those cases. And then there is another phenomenon which is uh, which was also noticed by by De Bertol and which is so far is, is unexplored. Is that uh, remember that for 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 the case of diagonal cones, I said before that the boundedness for of L two when p is equal to two is known in the sharp range. But here, if you use a rank bigger than three and non-diagonal weights, we don't know the sharp range of this boundedness. So there is, a, there is a, a necessary condition and a sufficient conditions we do not match. So here, actually, we are even far. When, when the, the, the weight is non-diagonal, we are far, in principle, from the, from the conjecture region. OK, so these are two phenomena that, that, that appear. And then there are two questions. Uh, if one, one can settle any of these two questions, then it would be interesting. So the first question is the one that has been settled. And the second question is the one that I think could be related with the similar problem for the Hilbert operator. So now, well, in the last part of the talk, I will talk a little bit about this result. This is a result of the colleague Onesa uh, and Nana from, from a couple of years ago. And they are able to uh, use in the correct form the decoupling inequality to solve completely this problem of the Berman projection in light cones with non-diagonal weights, OK? In all these cases that I put in the, in the figures uh, before, OK? So the, the, the Berman projection is bounded in all these regions, in all these things which are in orange color, all right? So <clears throat> what is the strategy that one has to use here? OK, so when p is between 2, and, and this number, 6, which is the number from the decoupling, one could use the usual decoupling conjecture. But, but observe what happens in the figure. So this is the region. Here you can use the usual decoupling, interpolate, and fill it. Here you can use the usual decoupling in this line. But if you interpolate with this corner, you don't fill everything. There is a lower triangle that, that is missing. And the same is going to happen here. OK, so the usual decoupling is here. And if you interpolate something, is missing. OK, so, um, well, and here, here it would be OK. Here, the use on the coupling, you, you can use it and interpolate, and, and it's not a problem. So, so something, something has to be modified, this proof. And then uh, uh, one could think that uh, the sharp version of the decoupling estimate for large p could suffice for this problem. So, from when I wrote the decoupling estimate, I put p between 2 and 6, and this number. Uh, and then what happens if you put p larger than 6? Then you have to pay with a power. But if you pay with this power and you insert it in the proof, 
you realize that you don't get optimal results for the Berman projection. So this is not the right thing. So you have to use a different object. And the object that you have to use actually when P is larger than six is try to put here uh, something, some, a power which is just epsilon, okay? No, not, not with a positive exponent. Maybe you don't have S equal to two. Maybe you have a different S, but try not to have any exponent here and try to have the best possible S here. So if you do that, you, you use this kind of decoupling inequality, then you will be obtaining actually uh, the, 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 the full result for the, for the Berman projection P nu. Okay, and what is the, the sharp exponent S? Well, the sharp exponent S is this one which appears here. Okay, it's better than P, the minimum of P and P prime, okay, which was uh, say the, the, the trivial exponent. Okay, so I have here I have here a picture. So this is uh, the general decoupling inequalities. One way to look at this general decoupling inequalities. So we, we, one is trying to pass from a P norm to a P norm here and an S norm here, and then one tries to identify the exponent that one has to put here. Remember that these functions are always supported in this slice of the cone of width delta. So what is the best the best power that you can put? Okay, so. Mm, well, modulo and epsilon, okay? I don't care much about epsilon. So if you just use, as I said before, the triangular inequality, S would be equal to one, okay? S equal to one is always true. If you use a plancher when P is equal to two, you have P equal to two here and S equal to two. And this green region is the trivial region for the decoupling inequalities, okay? So the point that was shown by, by Burgen and Demeter is that you can put exponent zero up here, you can put exponent zero for every p between one half and one six, for every p between two and six, okay, which is this line. So if you can put exponent zero here and you can put exponent zero here, you can interpolate and you can put exponent zero here, okay? And this line, this line, this uh, S's, this S's and P's that correspond to this segment are the ones that are going to have beta one equal to zero, okay? And these are the ones that you need to use in the uh, Berman projection problem, all right? And then from, from this set, you can pass to here using Helder inequality and you will have the sharp, the sharp exponents that are used uh, say in, in other situations, which are these powers over here, okay? These would be the powers that would appear here, but the sharp ones that we need are these ones. Okay, so this is more or less the, the, the idea of the proof of, in, of this general case of, uh, of non-diagonal weights. So I, I would like to conclude with some uh, with some open questions, which are still uh, so some of them I already mentioned. Um, so the first question is: uh, When the rank is three, we know actually uh, very little. We only know the green hexagon, and we have uh, for the moment uh, not much idea of how to exploit uh, the geometry of the of this uh, this finer geometry of the cone to prove boundedness beyond the green hexagon. So if we only use orthogonality, we are in the hexagon and in higher rank cones, it's not so clear how to do it, okay? Now you look at the boundary, the boundary depends on more parameters. So the, this, this the composition with plates depends on more parameters, delta and eta, and they can be small simultaneously and it's not so clear how to get any improvement at all over the green hexagon. So this is one of the problems which remains open. The higher rank situation, we are still in the same, situation we were in 2000. So the, the second problem is, um, well, if you cannot solve this, try at least to consider the positive operator in higher rank, look at the non-diagonal weights and try to see if you can characterize, well, this, this boundedness of this Hilbert type integral or the boundedness of the uh, Berman projection when P is equal to two and Q is variable. The, the, I, I think the two problems are very related, but that I don't have a proof now that they're equivalent, but probably probably you can say something here, you will be able to see something here and, and that, that will give new, new results okay? because here we are still far from the, from the conjecture. And then there is, a, there is a third problem which is open and that is open even for light cones, which is the local inequalities. So, Suppose, suppose you are not in the tube domain, but you are in the bounded symmetric domain, which is equivalent to the tube domain. So in that case, because this domain is bounded, not only it makes sense to look at LP inequalities, but also LP LQ inequalities. 
and these inequalities can be true when p is larger than q. Simply by, by Halder's inequality, if you have pp, you automatically will have uh, pq for any q smaller than p. You can go up to a one if you want. So this is a figure with p and q. This is the diagonal, the case p equal to q. And then now, for instance, for the light cone, we know the sharp range in the when p is equal to q. So if you use Halder inequality, you can go up to q equal to one. So you can get this green line, this green region automatically from the diagonal case. You, you get for free this green region. So here is is, is bounded. Okay. The thing is that the counterexamples, the outer counterexamples that you can put here to test, suggest that the boundedness holds in a larger region, which is not a consequence of the Halder inequality. There is a big chunk here, a big triangle, where we don't know much about it. So the, the only contribution, so this was already noticed by, by Becole and Bonami in, the, in their first paper. And this is a problem that, uh, well, it has not been much investigated for, for light cones. So the only results we have so far are from a paper in 2014 with Bonami and Nana. And, and here we are able to prove uh, a little bit more than the green region, okay, using techniques of positive operators, but there is still a big portion where we don't know anything. I mean, we haven't been able to use, for instance, the, the decoupling techniques uh, beyond, say, what is known in the diagonal. We don't know how to use the decoupling techniques here. So, so what is the real analysis problem that is related with this problem? Well, it turns out that this problem is equivalent to a local boundedness of the Berman projection. And local boundedness means that you have a function in LP, and then you multiply by a characteristic of the ball, you take a uh, Berman projection and you multiply again by a characteristic. This is a localized version of the Berman projection. So if this is bounded, this is bounded, and if this is bounded, this is bounded. They are equivalent, okay? So, so far, we don't know how to adapt these techniques in this setting, and this is also, I think, a challenging problem for, for future research. So I think I, I'm, I'm going to stop here. Thanks for listening. <laughs>